some glory in their birth, some in their skill, some in their wealth, some in their body's force, some in their garments, though newfangled ill, some in their hawks and hounds, some in their horse. And every humour hath its adjunct pleasure, wherein it finds a joy above the rest. But these particulars are not my measure. All these I better in one general best. Thy love is better than high birth to me, richer than wealth, prouder than garments cast, of more delight than hawks or horses be. And having thee, of all men's pride I boast. Wretched in this alone, that thou mayst take all this away, and me most wretched make. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. When I consider everything that grows, holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth naught but shows, whereon the stars in secret influence comment. When I perceive that men as plants increase, cheered and checked even by the self-same sky, vaunt in their youthful sap, at height decrease, and wear their brave state out of memory. Then the conceit of this inconstant stay sets you most rich in youth before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay to change your day of youth to solid night and all in war with time for love of you. As he takes from you, I engraft you new. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow, and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud liveries, so gazed on now, will be a tattered weed of small worth held. Then being asked where all thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty days, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes were an ill-eating shame and thriftless praise. How much more praise deserved thy beauty's use if thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse proving his beauty by succession thine. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feel'st it cold. Music to hear, why hear'st thou music sadly? Sweets with sweets war not, joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly, or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? If the true concord of well-tuned sounds by unions married do offend thine ear, they do but sweetly chide thee, who confounds in singleness the parts that thou shouldest bear. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering, resembling sire and child and happy mother, who all in one, one pleasing note 
producing, whose speechless song being many, seeming one, sings this to thee, thou single wilt prove none. So am I as the rich, whose blessed key can bring him to his sweet uplocked treasure, the which he will not every hour survey for blunting the fine point of seldom pleasure. Therefore are feasts so solemn and so rare, since seldom coming in the long year set, like stones of worth they thinly placed are, or captain jewels in the carcanet. So is the time that keeps you as my chest, or as the wardrobe which the robe doth hide, to make some special instant special blessed by new unfolding his imprisoned pride. Blessed are you whose worthiness gives scope, being head to triumph, being let to hope. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed, the dear repose for limbs with travel tired. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's work's expired. For then my thoughts from far where I abide intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids open wide looking on darkness which the blind do see. Save that my soul's imaginary sight presents thy shadow to my sightless view, which like a jewel hung in ghastly night makes black night beauteous and her old face new. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind, for thee and for myself no quiet find. Is it thy will thy image should keep open my heavy eyelids in the weary night? Dost thou desire my slumbers should be broken while shadows like to thee do mark my sight? Is it thy spirit that thou sensed from thee so far from home into my deeds to pry, to find out shames and idle hours in me, the scope and tenor of thy jealousy. Oh no, thy love though much is not so great, it is my love that keeps mine eye awake, mine own true love that doth my rest defeat, to play the watchman ever for thy sake. For thee watch I whilst thou dost wake elsewhere. From me far off, with others all too near. That time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. Tired with all these, for restful death I cry, as to behold desert a beggar born, and needy nothing trimmed in jollity, and purest faith unhappily forsworn, and gilded honor shamefully misplaced, and maiden virtue rudely strumpeted, 
and right perfection wrongfully disgraced, and strength by limping sway disabled, and art made tongue-tied by authority, and folly doctor-like controlling skill, and simple truth miscalled simplicity, and captive good attending captain ill. Tired with all these, from these would I be gone, save that to die I leave my love alone. Full many a glorious morning have I seen flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye, kissing with golden face the meadows green, gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy. Anon permit the basest clouds to ride with ugly wreck on his celestial face, and from the forlorn world his visage hide, stealing unseen to west with this disgrace. Even so, my sun, one early morn, did shine with all triumphant splendor on my brow. But out, alack, he was but one hour mine. The region cloud hath masked him from me now. Yet him for this my love no whit disdaineth. Sons of the world may stain when heaven's sun staineth. Being your slave, what should I do but tend upon the hours and times of your desire? I have no precious time at all to spend, nor services to do till you require. Nor dare I chide the world without end hour, whilst I, my sovereign, watch the clock for you. Nor think the bitterness of absence sour when you have bid your servant once adieu. Nor dare I question with my jealous thought where you may be or your affairs suppose, but like a sad slave, stay and think of naught, save where you are, how happy you make those. So true a fool is love that in your will Though you do anything, he thinks no ill. How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year. What freezings have I felt, what dark days seen, what old December's bareness everywhere. And yet this time removed for summer's time, the teeming autumn, big with rich increase, bearing the wanton burthen of the prime, like widowed wombs after their lord's decease. Yet this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit, for summer and his pleasures wait on thee, and thou away the very birds are mute. Or if they sing, tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, dreading the winter's near. Sweet love, renew thy force. Be it not said thy edge should blunter be than appetite, which but today by feeding is allayed, tomorrow sharpened in his former might. So, love, be thou, although today thou fill thy hungry eyes even till they wink with fullness. Tomorrow see again, and do not kill the spirit of love with a perpetual dullness. Let this sad interim like the ocean be, which parts the shore where two contracted new come daily to the banks that when they see return of love, more blessed may be the view. Or call it winter, which being full of care, makes summer's welcome thrice more wished, more rare.
To me, fair friend, you never can be old. For as you were when first your eye I eyed, such seems your beauty still. Three winters cold have from the forest shook three summers pride. Three beauteous springs to yellow autumn turned in process of the seasons have I seen. Three April perfumes in three hot Junes burned since first I saw you fresh, which yet are green. Ah, yet doth beauty like a dial hand steal from his figure and no pace perceived. So your sweet hue which methinks still doth stand, hath motion, and mine eye may be deceived. For fear of which, hear this, thou age unbred, ere you were born, was beauty's summer dead. When in the chronicle of wasted time I see descriptions of the fairest whites and beauty making beautiful old rhyme in praise of ladies dead and lovely nights, then in the blazon of sweet beauty's best, of hand, of foot, of lip, of eye, of brow, I see their antique pen would have expressed even such a beauty as you master now. So all their praises are but prophecies of this our time, all you prefiguring. And for they looked but with divining eyes, they had not skill enough your worth to sing. For we, which now behold these present days, have eyes to wonder but lack tongues to praise. As an unperfect actor on the stage, who with his fear is put beside his part, or some fierce thing replete with too much rage, whose strength's abundance weakens his own heart. So I, for fear of trust, forget to say the perfect ceremony of love's rite and in mine own love's strength seem to decay, or charged with burthen of mine own love's might. Oh, let my books be then the eloquence and dumb presages of my speaking breast, who plead for love and look for recompense, more than that tongue that more hath more expressed. Oh, learn to read what silent love hath writ. To hear with eyes belongs to love's fine wit. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. They that have power to hurt and will do none, that do not do the thing they most do show, who moving others are themselves as stone, unmoving, cold, and to temptation slow. They rightly do inherit heaven's graces and husband nature's riches from expense. They are the lords and owners of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. The summer's flower is to the summer's sweet, 
though to itself it only live and die. But if that flower with base infection meet, the basest weed outbraves his dignity. For sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Why, cousin? Why, Rosalind? Cupid, have mercy, not a word. Not one to throw at a dog. No, thy words are too precious to be cast away upon curs. Throw some of them at me. Come, lame me with reasons. But then there were two cousins laid up. When the one should be lamed with reasons, and the other mad without any. But is all this for your father? No. Some of it is for my father's child. Oh, how full of briars is this work-a-day world. They are but burrs, cousin, thrown upon thee in holiday foolery. If we walk not in the trodden paths, our very petticoats will catch them. I can shake them off my coat. These burrs are in my heart. Hem them away. I would try if I could cry hem and have him. Come, come, wrestle with thy affections. Oh, they take the part of a better wrestler than myself. Oh, a good wish upon you. You will try in time, in despite of a fall. But turning these jests out of service, let us talk in good earnest. Is it possible on such a sudden you should fall into so strong a liking with old Sir Roland's youngest son? The Duke, my father, loved his father dearly. Doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? By this kind of chase, I should hate him, for my father hated his father dearly, yet I hate not Orlando. No, Faith, hate him not for my sake. Why should I not? Doth he not deserve well? well? Let me love him for that, and do you love him because I do? Look, here comes the Duke, with his eyes full of anger. Mistress, dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, Uncle? You, cousin. Within these ten days, if that thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech your grace, let me the knowledge of my fault bear with me. If with myself I hold intelligence, or have acquaintance with mine own desires, if that I do not dream or be not frantic as I do trust I am not, then, dear uncle, never so much as in the thought unborn did I offend your highness. Thus to all traitors. If their purgation did consist in words, they are as innocent as grace itself. Let it suffice thee that I trust thee not. Yet your mistrust cannot make me a traitor. Tell me whereon the likelihood depends. Thou art thy father's daughter. There's enough. So was I when your highness took his dukedom. So was I when your highness banished him. Treason is not inherited, my lord. But if we did derive it from our friends, what's that to me? My father was no traitor. Then, good my liege, mistake me not so much to think my poverty is treacherous. Dear sovereign, hear me speak. Aye, Celia, we stayed her for your sake, else had she with her father ranged along. I did not then entreat to have her stay. It was your pleasure and your own remorse. I was too young that time to value her, but now I know her. If she be a traitor, why, so am I. 
We still have slept together, rose at an instant, learned, played, ate together. And wheresoe'er we went like Juno's swans, still we went coupled and inseparable. She is too subtle for thee, and her smoothness, her very silence, and her patience speak to the people and they pity her. Thou art a fool. She robs thee of thy name, and thou wilt seem more bright and seem more virtuous when she is gone. Then open not thy lips. Firm and irrevocable is my doom which I have passed upon her. She is banished. Pronounce that sentence then on me, my liege. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. You, niece, provide yourself. If you outstay the time upon mine honor and in the greatness of my word, you die. Oh, my poor Rosalind, whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change fathers, I will give thee mine. I charge thee, be not thou more grieved than I am. I have more cause. Thou hast not, cousin, prithee be cheerful. Knowest thou not that Duke hath banished me, his daughter? That he hath not. No, hath not. Rosalind lacks then the love which teacheth me that thou and I are one. Shall we be sundered? Shall we part, sweet girl? No, let my father seek another heir. Therefore devise with me how we may fly, whither to go and what to bear with us. And do not seek to take the charge upon you to bear your griefs yourself and leave me out. For by this heaven, now at our sorrows pale, say what thou canst, I'll go along with thee. Why, whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger will it be to us maidens as we are to travel forth so far? Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of umber smirch my face. The like do you. So shall we pass along and never stir assailants. Well, were it not better, because that I am more than common tall, that I did suit me all points like a man? A gallant curt lax upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart lie there what hidden woman's fear their will. We'll have a swashing and a marshal outside, as many other mannish cards have that do outface it with their semblances. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? I'll have no worse a name than Jove's own page, and therefore, look, you call me Ganymede. But what will you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Aliena, but cousin. What if we essayed to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort to our travel? He'll go along o'er the wide world with me, leave me alone to woo him. Let's away and get our jewels and our wealth together, devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. I will speak to him like a softly lackey, and under that habit play the knave with him. You here, Forrester? Very well, what would you? I pray you, what is the clock? You well, should ask me what time of day. There's no clock in the forest. Then there is no true lover in the forest. Else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as the clock. But why not the swift foot of time? Had that not been as proper? By no means, sir. Time travels in divers places with divers persons. I'll tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. I prithee, who doth he trot with all? Mary. He trots half of the young maid between the contract of her marriage and the day it is solemnized. If the interim be but a senite, time's pace is so hard that it seems the length of seven year. <laughs> who ambles time with all? With a priest that lacks Latin and a rich man that hath not the gout. <laughs> but the one sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. The one lacking the burden of lean and wasteful learning, the other knowing no burden of heavy, tedious penury. <laughs> this time, ambles with all. Who does he gallop with all? With the thief to the gallows. For though he goes softly as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. <laughs> Who stays it still with all? The lawyers and the vacation. <laughs> For they sleep between term and term, and then they perceive not how time moves. <laughs> Where dwell you, pretty youth? With the shepherdess, my sister, here in the skirts of the forest, like fringe upon a petticoat. Are you a native of this place? As the coney that you see dwell where she is kindled. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. 
Yes, I've been told so of many. But indeed, an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was in his youth an inland man, one that knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I've heard him read many lectures against it. And I thank God I am not a woman to be touched with so many giddy offences as he hath generally taxed their whole sex with all. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he led to the charge of women? Well, they were none principal. They were all like one another, as halfpence are. Every one fault seeming monstrous till his fellow fault came to match it. <laughs> I prithee, recount some of them. Oh, no, I will not cast away my physic but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns, elegies on brambles, all forsooth defying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaped. I pray you, tell me your remedy. Oh, there is none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I'm sure you are not a prisoner. What were his marks? Well, a lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. But I pardon you for that, for simply your having him beard is a younger brother's retinue. Then your hose should be ungartered, your bonnet unbended, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are other point de vue, your accoutrement, as loving yourself than seeming the love of any other. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it? You may as soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant she's apter to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points in which women still give the lie to their consciences. But, in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees, wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to the youth by the white hand of Rosalind. I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so much in love? as your rhymes speak. Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I tell you, deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. <laughs> but I profess curing it by counsel. <laughs> Did you ever cure any, so? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his oh. mistress. And I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are for the most part cattle of this colour, would now like him and now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him till I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, you I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind and come every day to my coat to woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it and I'll show it you. And by the way, you shall tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good you. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever, as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time, come not thou near me. And when that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks, pity me not, as till that time I shall not pity thee. And why, 
I, I pray you? Who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What though you have no beauty? As by my faith, I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed. Must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why, well, what means this? Why do you look on me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. Odds my little life, I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entail my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man, and she a woman. Tis such fools as you that make the world full of ill-favoured children. Tis not her glass, but you that flatters her. And out of you, she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But mistress, know yourself, down on your knees, and thank heaven fasting for a good man's love. But I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy. Love him, take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So oh, take a to thee, shepherd. Fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I had rather hear you chide than this man woo. Well, he's fallen in love with her foulness, and she'll fall in love with my anger. If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll sauce her with bitter words. But why look you so up at me? For no ill will I bear you. Oh, I pray you do not fall in love with me, for I'm falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. If you will know my house, tis at the top of olives here hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister. Shepherd is, look on him better and be not proud. Though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Come, to our flock. Dead shepherd, now I find thy saw of might. Who ever loved that loved not at first sight? Why, how now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You were lover, and you served me such another trick, never come in my sight more. My fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. Break an hour's promise in love. He that will divide a minute into a thousand parts, and break but a part of the thousandth part of a minute in the affairs of love, it may be said of him that Cupid has clapped him on the shoulder, but I'll warrant him half home. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, you'll be so tardy, come no more in my sight. I'd as leaf be wood of a snail. Of a snail? I have a snail. But though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head. <laughs> a better jointure, I think, than you can make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. Oh, what's that? My horns. <laughs> which such as you are fain to be beholding to your wives for. But he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. It pleases him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of a better leer than you. Come, woo me, woo me, for now I'm in a holiday humour and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now, and I were your very, very Rosalind? Mm, I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, you were better speak first. And when you were gravel for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. Very good orators, when they are out, they will spit. And for lovers lacking, God warn us, matter, the cleanliest shift is to kiss. <laughs> How if the kiss be denied? Then she puts you to entreaty, and there begins new matter. Who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Marry that should you, if I were your mistress. Or I should think my honesty ranker than my wit. What of my suit? Not out of your apparel, and yet out of your suit. <laughs> Am not I your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Well, in her person, I say, I will not have you. Then, in mine own person, I die. No, faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time there was not any man died in his own person videlicit in a love cause. Troilus had his brains dashed out with the Grecian club, yet he did what he could to die before, and he's one of the patterns of love. Leander, he'd have lived many a fair year, no hero had turned none. 
If it had not been for a hot midsummer night, poor good youth, he went but forth to wash him in the hell's pond, and being taken with the cramp, was drowned. <laughs> and the foolish chroniclers of that age found it was Hero of Sestos. But these are all lies. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right, Rosalind, of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand, it will not kill a fly. But come, now I will be your Rosalind in a more coming on disposition. And ask me what you will, I will grant it. Then love me, Rosalind. Yes, faith will I. Fridays and Saturdays and all. And wilt thou have me? I am twenty such. What sayest thou? Well, are you not good? Oh, I hope so. Well, then, can one desire too much of a good thing? <laughs> Come, sister, you shall be the priest and Marius. Give me your hand, Orlando. What do you say, sister? Baby, Marius. I cannot say the words. You must begin. Will you, Orlando? Go to. Will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? I will. Aye, but when? Why, now, as fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for my husband. There's a girl goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thought runs before her actions. So do all sorts. They're we. Now tell me how long you would have her after you've possessed her. Forever and a day. Say a day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they're wives. I would be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing like Diana and the fountain, and I will do that when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. <laughs> but will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. But else she could not have the wit to do this. The wiser, the way with her. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out at the casement. Shut that, to will out at the keyhole. Stop that to fly with the smoke out of the <laughs> chimney. A man that had a wife with such a wit, he might say, wit with a wilt. Nay, you might keep that check for it till you met your wife's wit going through your neighbor's bed. And what wit could wit have to excuse that? Mary, to say she came to seek you there. <laughs> you shall never take her without her answer unless you take her without her tongue. <laughs> oh, that woman that cannot make her fault her husband's occasion let her never nurse her child herself, for she will breed it like a fool. <laughs> for these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. Alas, dear love, I cannot lack thee two hours. I must attend the Duke at dinner, but by two o'clock I will be with thee again. I go your ways, go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as much, and I thought no less. That flattering tongue of yours won me. Tis but one cast away, and so come death. <laughs> Two o'clock is your hour. Aye, sweet Rosalind. By my troth, and in good earnest, and so God mend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical break promise, and the most hollow lover, and the most unworthy of her you call Rosalind that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. Therefore, beware my censure and keep your promise. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosalind. So, adieu. Well, time is the old justice that examines all such offenders, and let time try. Adieu. It is not the fashion to see the lady the epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the lord the prologue. If it be true that good wine needs no bush, it is true that a good play needs no epilogue. Yet to good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove the better by the help of good epilogues. 
What a case am I in then, that am neither a good epilogue, nor cannot insinuate with you in the behalf of a good play. I am not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O oh women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O oh men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering, none of you hate them, that between you and the women the play may please. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I defied not. And I'm sure as many as have good beards or good faces or sweet breaths will for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell.